Did English word die? Did they sound the death knell? Yet something survived for the house of Ravel. And welcome back to House of Revels, the Theatre Through the Ages podcast. I'm Mingma. And I'm Olivia. And we are theatre practitioners taking you on a journey through the history of theatre in Britain. From naught to now. Each episode we discuss a different theatre style, its context, origin and form, and then we rank the theatre style in four categories. Finally, we decide whether this style deserves to join the illustrious House of Revels, the great and noble hall for only the best of British theatre. In this episode, we are discussing Old English and also Beowulf. Because no one knows what English is. <laughs> what is English? What old is English? English. No. Old English tea? Old English uh, fry up? No. Old English language? I think it's because, well, I, I put in Beowulf because, you know, we've got to have that clickbait, haven't we? Clickbait. All those people searching Beowulf online. Beowulf, which I'm sure most people will have heard of, if not actually know what it actually is, is an old English poem. And it's the most famous of this particular genre. And fun fact, old English literature is even more incomprehensible than Shakespeare. In fact, Shakespeare is a modern, modern Middle English. So, um... So this is going to be a very fun and easy episode, is it, Mingma? Or are you going to take us on a journey and explain some things as we go along? Uh, let's go on a journey and the pronunciation is going to be interesting. <laughs> I'm loving this role reversal. I think this is all coming back to you now. <laughs> Just because I couldn't say Caligula in the second episode, now here we are. Now here we are. You've got all the difficult words. To be honest, I think I'm embracing it. I think, you know, it's getting to a stage, you know. I, I think you a have witch to. at heart, I, you know, it feels like <laughs> chanting at a certain point. <laughs> I would say with all of this, though, that though mm. in general, when speaking Old English and this kind of thing, it's pretty incomprehensible to modern audiences and to our um, modern ear, actually a lot of the words are still very much used today. So there's an interesting thing there, which we'll get Ooh. into. Let's kick us off then by talking about the origins. So this is the section where we discuss the origins of the theatre style. We trace its beginnings and what influenced its development. Nice. All right. So... First thing in Origins is uh, st- the good old fashioned storytelling because we haven't talked about that enough mm. next to the fireside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't even know what a story is. <laughs> storytelling. Um, so classic good old fireside storytelling tradition. Telling stories is a necessary part of language. I think we've done this about five times now, etc., mm-hmm. uh, etc. Et All of those classic origins. So you've done that. That's over in a corner. Okay, more interesting for this is... Um, that Old English really covers the roots of English through to the Norman invasion of 1066. That's the kind of period we're looking at okay. in terms of literature and dra- drama. Most of what survives in Old English literature nowadays is ecclesiastical, mm. um, so churchy. So most of the text of Old English, which is remains, are sermons, which are clearly fictitious. <laughs> uh, so people writing about saints' lives, Bible translations, translations of early Christian teachings, mm. narrative history and poetry. That's roughly in the kind of scale of how much quantity we've got of each thing. Okay. So poetry is pretty far down on the scale. So we've got very smallish smidgen which we have left. The first uh, poem which we have, which is really considered the first poem in English, is called Cademan's Hymn. I think we've spoken about this. I think... Yes. Uh, And that was composed in the 7th century, and so is considered though much of what we're looking at now the times are debated 11th century is where most of kind of poetry and this kind of thing is coming from we have to also answer the question of if it's english old english literature why are we doing it in a theater podcast um (laughs) not because we're not stupid we're not stupid (laughs) no not well sometimes sometimes we can be stupid but we yeah we're counting this because these would have been performed. Remember at this time, so many people were illiterate. And so poems are never r- written to be published. Mm. And they're, they're written to be performed. They're, or they are written down, having proved their popularity on the floor in terms of, you know, at a feast, someone enjoyed it and therefore they're going to take the painstaking time to write mm. it down afterwards. So this is theatre of a certain kind. Okay. Uh, in fact, Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien, very exciting, who was an academic in this field, argued in 1936 that Beowulf and other Old English literature was suffocating under the weight of scholarship 
that and trying to tie it into history and trying to look at it as historical documents and saying these are poems you need to leave them as poems understand them i see as this kind of as this art form Uh, yeah this idea of um as you're saying like we try and analyze something and does that take away i mean it goes back to the whole thing of art versus science like it's an art and we should take it as an art and we should take it as something that's to be appreciated and not necessarily studied so in depth yeah yeah it's like trying to study Shakespeare in an English classroom. There are so many people who hate Shakespeare because they were and they were brought up on something which just doesn't make sense on any level. You totally over, you know, overstudy, and it. It's we didn't even read yeah. the whole of Macbeth. We only had selected scenes to read in our English class. We really? we were like we don't, don't we don't have time. <laughs> you've got to read you've got to read these core scenes for the exam. To be fair, I had a reasonably all right English teacher who cast us. So she decided she actually was totally partisan and decided, right, you're good at reading, you're good at reading, you're good at reading, and so you're going to be these characters go for the entirety of the term. So oh, were it. can you imagine? Oh, yeah, no, that never would have happened at my school. <laughs> All right, so storytelling as always, and this is kind of the basic origins of how this developed. Another origin is Vikings. So from last episode, the whole Viking story to mm-hmm. telling tradition, and there's much overlap with Viking form and structure and style. Like we spent ages talking about their different, very, very kind of rhythmical and very almost mathematical structures. Uh, And a lot of that is similar in this style. Uh, Remember that the Anglo-Saxons themselves came from Germany, you know, 200 years or so before all of this. And they thought of themselves as English at this point, but they weren't natural Bretons. The Bretons went to Brittany, fun fact. Anglo-Saxon, because they came from Germany, they would have had a root common language with the Vikings. So how much crossover of these kind of styles is a similar source or is that one is kind of massively influencing the other? It's it's hard to tell. I read that something like 50% of the English language comes from German, like German words. Well, there's a really interesting argument Mm. around this. Um, I heard, uh, God, we're going to keep on talking about Shakespeare, but I heard a really interesting argument that the reason why Shakespeare resonates not only in England, but also worldwide, Mm -hmm. is because when he was writing was this wonderful root moment where the romantic style of European languages, so French and Spanish and, you know, all of that lot, and the Germanic, so German, uh, Dutch, um, Scandinavian languages in general, Swedish, uh, basically the influences are about 50 50 in english at that point okay. so it means there's enough resonance and because there's so many of those languages and then roots to all the dialects outside mm. of it um that's one reason why uh if you speak shakespeare's um in a different country even if they might not understand all of it there's enough for there, each one which brings oh, that's so clever it is it, it, it's an interesting argument it, you, you never know how much of it is true or not but it, mm. i like that one i think that's yeah. quite it, it rings true to my soul <laughs> feels nice <laughs> um yes no we do need to remember anglo-saxons as as you said actually in the liturgical episode after the romans left we got invaded by all these germanic tribes and that is mm. the roots of old english and when i try and pronounce some old english later you'll hear how similar it is to the viking stuff as well so there is definitely a kind of a German, real germanic root and though we get invaded by the Normans later on and suddenly everyone says, oh, well, French is the main thing. Uh, almost all of the hundred most common words in English are from Old English. Final thing about Vikings is actually in the form mm. of stories, which is that there are some good old fashioned strong women in the poetry which we have, which remains in um, Old English. And there, there's a lot of arguments from feminist historians like Helen Damico that uh, the way these women portrayed just comes from Norse culture. So this idea of the woman who is, um, they revere kind of homely wisdom and herbs and magical elements and this kind of stuff. And that very much comes from the old pagan matriarchal tradition rather than the patriarchal Christian tradition. So Mm. women are more important when you're a pagan. (sighs) I just, every time I hear, every time we talk about women, I just think I get a little bit sad. It was going oh, so well. <laughs> it's going so well, and I know how it goes. It's like, it's like when you read, like when you introduce someone for a fil- to a film, and you know how it ends, and they're really hopeful, and it's really painful. Uh, next origin is this uneasy mix of paganism and Christianity. And again, we spoke in your episode as well mm-hmm. around um, this idea of Christianity was very, very good at adopting old customs, just saying, yeah, that's Christianity. You actually were right worshipping Mary when actually you're worshipping an old pagan goddess. But actually, she's Mary. She's Mary. It's fine. She's Mary. You need to remember that this very much is a world where gods and monsters are still very real. Um, and it isn't that the um, 
it isn't that oh these are old stories of people who have died out it's that these people are just not near us but they do exist and the best example of this is saint christopher the mm-hmm. cynocephali saint and a cynocephali is a dog-headed man like fluffy <laughs> but more fluffy from harry potter but like more well, the, like, basically they believed at this point that um that these tribes of people who were half men half animal absolutely exist they just weren't near us so uh one of the old english poems is called the wonders of the east and in it they describe a tribe of blemai blemai are people who have kind of faces in their chests and um saint christopher is supposedly from a greek tribe of cynocephali which are and i'm just going to show you this is literally a 12th century illustration of saint christopher from a church <laughs> <laughs> as in, I kid you not that it really was a thing of kind of I've uh, I love that he's I love that he's doing the hand yeah, he's absolutely a saint he's it, put sho- on. it shows Christianity is for everyone which yeah. I think is wonderful in its own way it's not I, I'm not trying to completely deride them because it no. is a thing of, of Christianity is inclusive yeah <laughs> absolutely but it, it, it proves this thing that God that monsters and different people who absolutely weren't human existed at this time very very mm. really so also bearing that in mind as we were saying about christianity being very good at adopting pagan traditions um quite often the people who were writing down these poems if they've had an oral tradition beforehand were christian clerics and so we'd have a very interesting thing of possibly a pagan beginning story then the christianity came in then the pagan got more interesting and then actually it was written down by a monk you probably had to think about putting a bit more christianity into them yeah there's a weird kind of interesting sandwich thing going on yeah it's like a (laughs) It's like a, it's definitely not quite a rose tinted glasses, but like it's glasses. Christian, Christian filtered glasses. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The final origin is mm. the idea of the of history as not being fact. Yes. And again, we spoke about this before. The difference between story and history just didn't matter. What was important was remembering the key facts of why. So a good example of this in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is the story of Sina Wolf and Sinaherd, which is an entry for the year 757 in the Chronicle. So the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, I think, was started by Alfred. There are five, possibly six strains of it. And thought is that in six monasteries across the UK, uh, every year they'll be recording what happened in that year. And so when we look at the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle now, we have records of what happened in each year from all of these different sources, but they're written in columns. So you have year... 757 and then versions a b and they will be slight variants but they will in general be the same things it is actually a chronicle so you can tell in general obviously there are some years where they skip and then like all of us who are trying to do a diary just go oh that happened yeah quick bullet point (laughs) but normally the amount of detail shows actually they were writing at the time and so that's the anglo-saxon chronicle but one entry in the year 757 is a lengthy account of a power struggle between the west Ca- saxon king Sinewulf and the brother of the former former king sigebrut it basically reads like a play unlike a lot of the other kind of sections of chronicle it has an inclusion of direct speech it has dialogue between the followers and the two main protagonists it suggests the story might have circulated orally before. and so clearly then in 757 they decided right this goes down because this is important in a certain form we could say this is evidence of definitely a play or some mm-hmm. kind of form which which is interesting but also this idea of history and this idea of what matter no that is really interesting and i get yeah like you're saying that um storytelling well yeah we don't want to go too much on storytelling is theater but then i think it is fundamentally theater in a way i think one thing we have to consider like is the broad term this this idea of like having direct speech and dialogue and and as you say like it must have been important for them to write it down i mean as you said we're using a very loose definition of theater but as peter brook says in his work the empty space he says it only takes someone looking at an empty space and another person walking across that empty space for an act to take place yeah that's so true though isn't it like it's really that simple so to sum up then, we talked about how Cademan's hymn was possibly the oldest piece of English literature. Uh, we talked about the influence of the Vikings and how much of the uh, Old English and Viking origins are the same. We've got a crossover there. Uh, we've got this idea of, again, Christians coming in and overlapping and uh, taking over pagan traditions. Um, but 
<laughs> as I will never forget, <laughs> St. Christopher, the St. Christopher. saintly dog. <laughs> the dog saint. No, he is a dog-headed saint. Um, but also the fact that monsters really existed. They were just, you know, hiding or they were in, they were quite far away. And then finally we have this idea of history again being not fact, um, the idea that it's more important to communicate the ideas, which has evidence in 747 uh, that there was a real life play. 757! Ah! Oh! <laughs> okay. So, moving on, contact. So this is the part where we discuss the current day events. As this form developed, what else was going on in history? What economic, social, political movements might affect it? Wonderful. All right. So again, we have this issue that on, or, that we are using one episode to cover 400 years of stuff. Mm. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> so there's always going to be a heck of a lot going on. But, uh, but here's a brief overview. So the rise of English as a literary language was largely due to a programme of education and translation initiated by Alfred the Great. Alfred very much believed in this connection between religion and learning and national prosperity. He thought that the more educated population and a more godly population would create a better unity, better community and just generally more prosperity. And as we talked about in the liturgical drama episode, Alfred was all for teaching and performing in English as a form of nationality and keeping standards high. He charged the monk Alfric to teach the children of freemen the Bible, literacy and English. And this they did throughout the subsequent Norman invasion. He kept it going. Yes. Um, and okay. his descendants kept it going as well. And this also is where the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle can stem its roots from. Basically, there was a whole thing of uh, priests before Alfred came and did this who didn't know the Bible and couldn't read it. So, you know, they're like, yeah, there's, there's this Jesus bloke and can I have my pension, please? Because I am technically a priest, but I don't quite know. Under <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was just that they would be like, yeah, no, the audience doesn't know it. We have to say it to them. But the actual... No, no, actually, the actual priest didn't know either. Which is I mean, do you think they had, like, imposter syndrome? Were they ever going? Am I, I, am I? I think the more discerning ones would probably have felt that, but I think there's also definitely the ones who are going, mate, it's free money, I'll take it. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But one yeah. fun fact about all of this is that Alfred would teach mm -hmm. his pupils through drama. So he would oh. assign his pupils' roles, like a, you're a baker, you're a fisher, you're a monk, and then he'd ask them about their work as that character, and they would respond in character. So it's, it's literally hot seating. It's lit. Oh, hot seating. <laughs> I've not done that in years. <laughs> oh, flashbacks, 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 flashbacks. Flashback, flashback. When you put on a silly voice and you're like, my name's Mike and I'm 42. <laughs> when you're like a 16 year old girl and you're like, I love spending time with my children. And you're like, A star, brilliant work, brilliant work. Oh. And I'll just do a limp to get into character. Man, I oh, normally use it, if I'm a director, I normally use it in a complete dick move to get uh, actors to think about their parts. Especially in Shakespeare, because, because I normally had a bit more historical knowledge than other people. And we, if we were doing a history play, I'd go, how would you consider X, Y, and Z of history would inform your character? And they'd yeah. always be like, have you done your research into your part? I'm so glad I'm not in any of your shows, Minga. <laughs> I'm so glad I'd be there going, can do a funny walk. <laughs> a no. funny walk. That does sound good, though. Yeah, it is. As Churchill famously said, and everyone else, mm. normally victors write the history. But because of Alfred, English always did that job. English had become so ingrained as this language of literacy and of um, and this language of record that throughout all the all the turmoil of Danes and Saxons and all the rest of it, everything which happened was always written in English, even if the English were defeated. There was a widely held belief at the time that the world would end in a thousand years <laughs> after Christ's. Uh, Christ's Christ uh, <laughs> Christ's in the plural <laughs> and so many Saxons believed the Danish invasions of Lindisfarne and this kind of thing uh, was the beginning of doomsday the beginning the, the Danes oh were gosh. quite literally the end of the world coming world ending in 1000 can we just have a moment to think mm. about before 1066 yeah and then the same thing happened though in the year 2000 didn't it like with all the i mean we were too young to remember they everyone thought the world was going to end yeah. in the year 2000 like yeah the computers couldn't cope with the yeah. turn into the new double triple o's we yeah. learned nothing clearly <laughs> no in a thousand years we learn nothing it's a very very basic overview of what happens um 
during this time which we're talking about in terms of English and history, which is that there are waves of Vikings. So Al- Alfred, as we spoke mm-hmm. about with the cake story, um, uh, got rid of one wave of Vikings. And then an, and then the second proper wave of Vikings came and then it became pretty um, interspersed uh, up until Canute, mm-hmm. Canute the Great, who we mentioned in the Viking episode. It basically went Ethelred, Edmund Ironside, Canute, Harold the First, Harthur Canute, Edward the Confessor, Harold II, 1066. How many of those kings have you ever heard of before? <laughs> I mean, I've heard of Edward the Confessor, but I have to confess, I don't know much about him no. or why he's called Edward the Confessor. <laughs> to put it in terms which make more sense this time, mm-hmm. it's literally Saxon, Saxon, Dane, Saxon, Dane, Dane, Saxon, Saxon, Norman, right. in terms of the kings. So there is this weird kind of interspersion of different lineages and different all the rest of it going on. There's a lot of turmoil okay. at this time. So a lot of Old English poetry, and particularly Beowulf, Mm -hmm. as we're using this as the focus of this episode, uh, is likely to have been written the court of Canute the Great, who is Ethelred Ironside Canute. And then we've got the other ones. (laughs) Um, Unimportant. Unimportant. And Canute was married to Emma uh, of -hmm. Normandy. And Emma of Normandy, before she was married to Canute, was married to another English king called Ethelred the Unready. And so Ethelred is Ethelred Edmund Ironside Canute. Then Edward the Confessor is actually her child. Two more down. So she's she, and also she's the person who William the Conqueror claims lineage into um, the English throne from. So she's incredibly important. That sound it. And she's just Emma. She's not. Oh, she's Emma of Normandy. Emma of Normandy is her name. There's okay. a lot more history around her and all the rest of it, but we do not have time for mm. all of that. But she is very exciting. Please listen. Find out more. There's a podcast called Rex Factor, which done an entire episode. Shout out to them for this link it in the show notes but for sure. the biggest things to remember is firstly the emma of normandy normandy was the land of norsemen at this time so when we think about the normans coming in actually it's a danish tradition coming in so it's it's what it's one more kind of in that tradition of saxon king saxon king dane king Sa- oh look and then there's another version of danes coming in and emma and canute had a, a fairly successful and stable relationship so that's a long list of kings but a lot of them only ruled for a year or so canute was longer can you had, I think, about 30, 20 years, which is pretty good. You okay, know. <laughs> that sounds pretty They good. were very aware of having to try and marry these two disparate identities, but also now both had a claim to England. And so were very aware of the, power, the soft power of ceremony and culture and this kind of thing. And uh, the other fun thing is that Canute was also the king of Denmark, and in Denmark he is known as Canute the Great. So, ah. in fact... Wessex was the capital of a North Sea empire. So rather than thinking of England as being this one homogenized nationality, it was actually mm. the kingdom of Wessex was kind of like the crowning capital. And then the rest of England was on the same level as Denmark and Scandinavia in this empire of Canutes. It, we're actually part, we're not really Great Britain at the moment, we're just part of the empire. Yeah, as the you enormous say, kind of trade routes, all the rest of it going between mm. the two across the North Sea. Just so we're on the same page, we're covering about 400 years in this episode, starting with Alfred the Great. He's like the starting point. He kind of instills this idea into monks of learning and learning English or the English of then. um, And that kind of travels on and we have people learning English um, and important people of the church who should know about the Bible. And yeah, we have waves of Vikings coming in and then a series of... uh, Saxon, Saxon, Dane, Saxon, Dane, Dane, Saxon, Saxon. <laughs> uh, it's a shame we've already got a uh, theme tune, isn't yeah. it, Mingma? Because it could just be that it every week. Yeah, it is Divorce Beheaded Died. <laughs> divorce Beheaded Died, but funky. Yeah. Uh, and then we have Emma of Normandy, who's like this hugely important and figure. Naughty Empire. Fun. And All right. Naughty Empire. Okay, so moving on to the form itself, this section, we're going to talk about the main features of the theatre style. All right, so firstly, the form itself. There are roughly 30,000 lines of Old English poetry surviving, mostly in four manuscripts copied down in the late 10th and early 11th centuries, which is roughly the time of Canute. Uh, These are the Exeter Book, which is a collection Mm -hmm. of religious poetry and secular poetry, uh, which was donated to Exeter Cathedral by the Bishop Leofric in 1072. We just have a moment to realise just how extraordinary the cathedrals of this country are they have yeah. books which were donated that long ago it feels weird to hear the term 1072 because i think i only ever hear about the 11th century as 1066 so i'm like there were other years in that century <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no it's just 1066 no, that feeling. 
<laughs> anyway, no. so the next one is the Vercelli book, which is a collection of religious poetry and prose taken to Vercelli in Italy during the 11th century by pilgrims on their way to Rome. So a lot of these books, uh, their names have no relation at all to what's in them. But it's normally where they ended up because they're so old. Everyone goes, well, that book's at Exeter. So it's the Exeter book or it's the Vercelli book. The Junius Manuscript, which is an illustrated collection of four long religious poems bequeathed to the Bodleian Library in Oxford by an early owner, Franca Junius, again. Um, or, and then finally, Beowulf. Or the, no or the Noel Codex, because there are actually other stuff in, in its um, form. It is a collection of poetry and prose concerning marvels. It has The Life of St. Christopher, our favourite sinocephalisate. <laughs> Dog-headed saint. Uh, the Life of Judith, Wonders of the East, and the only copy of Beowulf. There is only one copy surviving of Beowulf, if that had gone. The general Ooh. kind of uh, genres for this style are heroic poetry... Uh, which is very, very similar to the Adiac stuff we did last episode, so I will not go further into that. Elegiac poetry, which is i.e. elegies. That's where the word comes from and all that fun yeah. stuff. Uh, wisdom poetry. So it's a bit like, there's one poem called The Ruin, which describes the decay of Britain after the Romans left, and it's all very, and here is the moral. I see. Fable, you know, that kind of thing. Uh. Another example is a poem called The Battle of Malden, which is, again, it's a, it's a historical des uh, description of something which happened. Uh, and the events of the poem is set not um, basically the battle in Malden is a real thing mm -hmm. and it happened but the events of the poem describing it are not set in the 10th century England but within the framework of an earlier heroic society ah, so okay. what matters is that the outcome of the battle where the Saxons are defeated in the poem matters much less in the general form of how it's written than the test of success is not victory against the Vikings but how all the members of the English army live up to the ideals of the I, heroic code it's not about like you dying in battle it's about how you, yes it's exactly. like yeah it's the chivalric code and like it, and the chivalric code comes from this like, right. very much yeah so I mean we do it today mm. like films about Dunkirk or something like that yeah and it's about how noble the people who were there were doing it. Final bits are adaptions of Greek and Roman literature. So, like, we've got uh, examples of The Phoenix, which is an Old English um, version of De Ave Feneci by Lycantius. So, Roman shit was still around. They were doing stuff. They were still there. around. Added ad ad adaptations, all that fun stuff. Narrative poems of St. Lives, St. Christopher, and original Christian poems, like The Dream of... Dream of the Rude is a poem telling the story of the crucifixion. So someone is saying, I'm visualising being a... Cro I suppose it's a bit like nowadays we have retellings of the Bible. Mm. They were doing the same thing. So, I mean, I remember the, um, the story of three trees you get cut down and one becomes the crib, one becomes the casket which the murder. A fairy asked them what they wanted to be and they said, I want to hold the biggest treasure and I wanted to... I, like, there's a children's story along oh. that kind of line which was written about 10 years ago I don't know that one do you no. not um, it was a really cute one uh, and there's another one by um, by Colm Tolbean about the testament of Mary which is Mary's perspective and this kind of stuff so we still write original stuff around the stories so to sum up Mingma so there are 30,000 lines of Old English and four manuscripts the Exeter book in Exeter the Vercelli book in Italy, the Junius manuscript, which was named after Francie Junius, and Beowulf. Uh, then the genres that are covered in these manuscripts and works are heroic poetry, elegiac poetry, um, the Battle of Molden, and then we have Greek and Roman work as well. And then finally, we have poems about saints like Year Old Boy, St. Christopher, and then uh, Dream of the Rude. Yeah. I think basically it's that they're, like us, they are taking historical or saints' li historical events or saints' lives or um, uh, or Christianity stories mm -hmm. and making fiction from yeah. them. Yeah. Okay. So. So. I'm excited. This is the moment we've all been waiting for. It is... Beowulf. Beowulf! Right, Beowulf is our example play for today of this style. So, uh, Beowulf is 3,182 lines long of alliterative verse. <laughs> so actually, that's like 10% of the Old English language yeah, that we've much. got written down. Okay. Of the, po so of the poetry it's... written down. Of the poetry written down. Yeah. Okay, I'm with you. Um, it's written in English, but takes place in different parts of Scandinavia over the course of the 6th century. When Wessex is just like a dandel of... I think, I think the first king of Wessex, so like one of the first kings ever of England, is appearing in the 6th century. So it's that 
early. It's all kind of like about our origin story. Fun form. I see. Everyone has been arguing back and forth about when it was actually written. Arguments from like the 7th century all the way through to the 11th. Uh, I find the argument most compelling that it was written for the court of the Engli- an English king with Scandinavian roots in the 10th or 11th century. What's so interesting about the poem is it's so clearly melding. It's written down by an Anglo-Saxon, so clearly they have affection for this story. And yet it's also mm-hmm. um, written in English. So it's not a Dane writing, because Danes also didn't want to record things and this kind of stuff. And it makes sense. There's a very obvious thing about this kind of melding in terms of structure and form and also in terms of the story being told of the two places. I don't think they're trying to make a great political statement with it, but there is definitely a melding going on, and that would make sense to be at this kind of 10th, 11th century moment. So there are two likely candidates for this English king with Scandinavian roots. One is the East Anglian royal house called the Woofinga, or the Woofingars. (laughs) Yes. Okay. Shush. Um, they're not a dog. <laughs> My lips not... are sealed. <laughs> uh, who we know had close links to Sweden, and it's probably from them that, that Sutton who, you know, that kind of great burial mound, that kind of time. And okay. and the other one is the Kingdom of Wessex and this North Sea Empire and Canute and And considering the general emphasis on record and literature as a legacy of Alfred in the Kingdom of Wessex and the importance of melding the two countries. My money is on Canute, that this poem was written or was written down and stabilised in the form we know it today in the time of Canute's court. I, that would make sense. And also just with what we said, talked about, about Emma of Normandy, and I know this is conjecture, mm. uh, as you would say, but like, she seems like the kind of woman who would be up for let's meld, let's bring two cultures together is a sense of that's quite a strategic thing to do mm. to be like yes I, I totally agree with that um mm. she is emma is the only queen of this time at all who gets her own personal history which she commissions so she knows about kind of legacy and about how, yeah. to, how to kind of rule the history because she gets her own thing she's written she's a smart woman it sounds like um so beowulf there are three parts of this poem Mm-hmm. Um, and they were very likely performed in consecutive evenings. So a bit like, you know, you watch two episodes of The Crown this evening and then two more and then, you know, through it. This mm-hmm. is that was this is their evening entertainment. So poem concerns Beowulf, the hero of the Geats, who were a North Germanic people inhabiting modern day Gotland. And Gotland is this tiny little island between Denmark and Sweden. Beowulf fights a series of monsters and rules as king of the Geats for approximately 50 years. So... The first part tells about Beowulf coming to the court of the king Hrothgar to defeat the giant Grendel. Uh, The second part is Grendel's mother taking vengeance and Beowulf defeating her. And the third part is set 50 years later when a dragon attacks uh, Beowulf's kingdom and Beowulf succeeds in killing it but is himself killed in the struggle. To me, I think that the time jump suggests that there are many more stories of Beowulf that Mm. that don't survive. Come on, look at the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You know, they, they, once once a good story is going, you know, you just, yeah. you just churn it if out. If he turns try... into a popular figure, if it's like people want, you know, want content, mm. keep keep giving them those stories. What more? I mean, you're saying he reigned for 50 years. Are you telling me people would be happy to be like, uh, where's the yeah. 50? We want the 50 year. Uh... Uh, we want one enormous poem for each year. Thank you Otherwise, just make him reign for three years. Not worth it. Yeah. So Beowulf himself seems to be fictional as a character, but the people he encounters are real life, like Hrothgar. We, there was a real king called Hrothgar. It's an amalgamation of myth and historical sources acting as, as world building for this new story. So kind of like okay. Doctor Who going to see Madame de Pompadour <laughs> or the MCU. Yeah. You know, it's, it's this thing of kind of, you know, fictional you. characters yeah. coming into our old stories. Right, so... To give an idea mm-hmm. of Beowulf, I'm not going to go through it all in the same way we did before. It begins, Huet e Gardena in Geardagum. So we the Spear Danes in days gone by. It's that, that's the kind of form of how it's written. Alliterative verse means that alliteration is the prime method to underline metre. So mm. the chatter and clatter of da 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 is alliteration because they're using the yeah. same consonants to kind of go... Um, go through it. So in this one, yeah. gardena in dagum. Yeah. There's a. Each line is broken up into an A and B and literally divided with a dash called a caesura. Um, so another example is of skilled scaffing scarpena pretum. So it's got this sk. So we have. Yeah. 
And a lot of kennings. Do you remember kennings from last time? <laughs> Remind me, Mingma? <laughs> no. Hello, I've got my English teacher oh. hat on and I'm asking you about... Why don't you give <laughs> listeners a reminder? <laughs> kennings are a form of describing everyday objects as something different. So um, the ginung oh, yeah. we talked about a bit. Or sea cleaver or something like that for ship. So you're descri- so basically you're using like a very posh poetic way of of describing something very everyday, and uh, they they use kennings to fill the meter. So the meter asks for ba bum ba bum ba 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 ba. They go and they use <laughs> kennings to just, rather than just say shit. They go the the the, the sea yeah. theme, ah, which did the the How much the do you think them. Shakespeare did that as well? By the way, Shakespeare definitely does it, but it's a there's a different question because Shakespeare. We always need to remember in Shakespeare that he, people in Shakespearean times mm. went to hear rather than to see a play. And so we need to remember that their scenery literally was visual. So he would, of course, go off on one with, with metaphors and similes and this kind of stuff. But how much is that? Because people were much better than we are today at visualising in their heads. So he was literally painting the scene for them. Or how much is it mm. him trying to fit into his metre? I don't know, in that kind of form. Probably a mixture of both. The other point is that um, uh, it actually it, it, it ties back into Beowulf, is that it's unlikely that these poets would have made up all of the alliterations and kennings themselves originally. They are unlikely to be original to this piece. Seamus Heaney, who's done one of the most famous modern translations of uh, Beowulf, views this uh, as a fully formed poetic language, uh, clearly part of a longer tradition. So... It's it's hard to describe. It's basically like we always know once upon a time starts a story. So there would have been kennings which everyone used to help with um, memory jogging, to help with understanding. Like uh, Homer uses wine dark sea constantly in the Iliad. Odysseus was looking right. out at the wine dark sea. And he, he would fill the meter, but also it was clearly a cultural resonance. Hmm. And that was something which people used. Yeah, you're into that zone. Okay, so Beowulf is in three parts. And it tells the story of Beowulf, a fictional character. But there are some non-fictional characters in Beowulf. He fights a giant, then he fights the giant's mother, and then he fights a dragon. And then it's got lots of alliteration in. Um, Its lines are separated by um, uh, a skelly? A skelida? Nowhere near. Nowhere near. (laughs) <laughs> the word in my head goes and then I've got it and you've got this idea of kenning so words being added together so like sea cleaver okay yeah. I'm with you exactly cool. so yeah. I guess that is uh, the form um so moving on to the scoring we score every theatre style in four separate categories sleight of hand scandal ripple or riot and legacy we each give a score out of 10 for the category leading to a maximum total of 80 finally we decide whether the theatre style deserves to enter the esteemed house of revels so the first category is sleight of hand here we explore the stagecraft in this theatre style Wunderbar. Right, so along with every other style mm. of minstrel who we've talked about in Vikings, in Fireside, yeah. in every single kind of thing, we've got all the old ones. All right, so singing, there's almost certainly going to be singing, and we have evidence of, of Aldhelm, the abbot of Sherborne, was known to sing poems. We have none of his remaining. Uh, being travellers, that would be yeah. quite exciting. Um, tricks of cadence, stage presence, you know, using props to help the stories. Basically, everything we've already spoke about, just. Copy, paste, insert, and now let's talk about something else. All right, okay, I get the message, Mingma. <laughs> Fine. No, so there is actually... Mm. I'm going to add one more thing into sleight of hand specifically for this style, which is verbal sleight of hand, because the Anglo-Saxons loved a good old word. Well, they're literally putting words together, so I'm not yeah. surprised. Um, so the Exeter book, which is one of the, um, the poetry books which we talked about earlier, uh, contains 95 riddles. Oh, no, I can see where this is going, Mingma. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes it's coming so i'm gonna challenge you to uh, <laughs> me personally <laughs> yes oh, you personally no. to try and guess this riddle and just to make you feel better i'm gonna try and say it in um <laughs> in old english first and so then and then give you the english translation okay i, was, <laughs> I thought you were gonna say just to make you feel better i'll say it in a language you don't understand i was like that's gonna help me massively thank <laughs> you okay so i'm going to say yeah say it in old english i'm only gonna say the first four lines in old english because it's a long old riddle interestingly okay um but it, you begin to hear kind of the alliteration i tiem hanarga isa neund 
bile yabanat ba de wolkasat et sumwerik of sich wesaru fred sich friosan frothwe nelayana and so those are the first four lines of the full english i live alone wounded by iron struck by a sword tired of battle work weary of blades often i see war fight a fearsome foe i crave no comfort that safety might come to me about of the war strife before i am among men perish completely but the forged brand strike me hard edged and fiercely sharp the hard work of smiths they bite me in the strongholds i must wait for a more murderous meeting never a physician in the battlefield could i find one with her peeled wounds but my sword slashes grow greater is it a horse ooh interesting um it is not okay no <laughs> interesting answer but that's not correct because i heard because i thought about um the idea of a physician well not a physician it would be probably like a vet um the idea <laughs> the idea of like iron work and horses having bits and like brand horses. um yeah no it's not a horse okay to be fair i i totally see it and that's probably a really good answer i'm uh, it's it's a shield Oh, <laughs> you sounded like oh I get no, it now. I, I do uh, get, no, it. get it. <laughs> you see, in many ways, you could say the horse was your shield. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, I, I like it it. though. I like that. It's um, no, the idea of the but the forged brand mm. strike me hard edged and fiercely sharp. The handwork, so you can just see the dents in the shield as it goes, and the fact mm. that he doesn't want the battle to continue. But yeah, they loved wordplay, and I think that's a little legacy here for the cryptic yeah. crossword lovers among us. Amongst us, <laughs> you know. we know it's you, Mabel. <laughs> we know you love a cryptic crossword. I can't do cryptic crossword. I do. I do the Guardian quick, but I can't do cryptic. I well. look at them and I go, "It's just, it's just words. You've just put a selection yeah. of words on the page that don't make sense." Yeah, kennings we can definitely add in. Okay. to sleight of hand as well. Uh, but the other thing is good old-fashioned word creation. Part of that is also Kennings. It's kind of in the Germanic tradition where if you don't have a word for something, you just add a bit on to make a word which makes sense of it. And this is kind of what's happening here, but in Old English. So here are some examples from Beowulf of word creation. They're literally because there was nothing which suited. So Bauerhaus is bone house, which means body. Glearwood, which means gleewood. Okay. Harp. Which, if people remember from previous episode is we have the strolling players and the gleeman the gleeman yeah and also the gleeman are very likely the ones telling beowulf here's the here's the continuity they're the, probably the ones telling the story like the scalds they would be the professional storytellers okay. the whales way no, the, just the welsh way of doing something <laughs> no whales with the h Mm-hmm. Oh God, I had a moment. <laughs> this is such a tangent. <laughs> when I was at school, I was, I was known for whenever I got very, very tired, I would just come out with the most <sighs> weird tangents in classes. I'd just kind of say what was on my mind. <laughs> and there was a moment when we were talking about whales in history for some reason. Mm-hmm. I think it was some kind of battle of some sort. And I came out and said, did you know that four years ago, when Parliament was debating a bill on the country Wales, there was a whale in the River Thames in <laughs> the entire class. Oh, Mingma. <laughs> what are you like? What is this? You know, just like in front of everyone, just like, this is my point because I want to distract from the fact I'm incredibly tired. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't just hold up a picture of a whale. <laughs> okay, this is what I've been drawing for the last four hours. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, and I also think we need to just put in word creation as a sleight of hand thing. That is also a legacy because talk about everyone coins, Shakespeare coins, you know, and if you look at stuff like French, mm. where there really is not, uh, you know, they, there's such a tight, rigid idea of what the language is. You're not allowed to add new words, whereas in English it's free for all. I tried to add a new word when I was a kid. I was going to write into the dictionary. I wanted to create the word oceous, which means like a large expanse of water. I think basically just a big expanse, like oceous, like it's almost like ocean-like. I was like 10. Yeah. It sounds like it should be a word, though. Oceous. It's not. Partly in my own kind of like dyslexic way, I do just make up words. And quite often I'm not necessarily sure if I've made it up or whether I'm just... Whether it's a word which I don't know. Yeah. And my mum is a linguist and has these moments where she just goes, Is that slang or is it you? It's me. <laughs> it's me, probably. <laughs> are you being cool and hip or are you just being <laughs> Mingma? <laughs> <laughs> literally though <laughs> should i add it to my dictionary or should i leave you alone yeah uh, it's funny anyway uh, um right so 
Um, the other point to make, which is very quick, mm-hmm. which is that at this time, uh, Chinese and Arabic were the lang- was the language of poetry. You know, like they were absolute the languages who were in this time they were completely winning every battle when it came to literature and all the rest of it but in the west no language in europe competed with the english for literature both in church and secular fiction english was the best language in europe for all of this which is yeah why they it's all recorded okay so so we've got quite actually quite a lot then for sleight of hand we've got the word creation we've got the riddle (laughs) I still think it's horse. Um, <laughs> what are you thinking then in terms of scoring? I'll give it a five, I think, because I think it is very cool. And I think there's a lot which is legacy afterwards. It's not God's descending from machine. Mm. And I mean, these aren't the first riddles created. They've not, no, not. created this yeah. riddle form per se. So I think I'm going to be harsher than you for once and give it a four. Okay. Mm. So, right. Scandal, the second category. Was there any juicy gossip surrounding this style yeah. on stage Right, we're well, back in this issue of the early episodes. Mm. Firstly, 400 years, so of course society changes a fair amount. Yeah. And we're putting a lot of different styles into one episode because there's no way of... There's no way of... There's we not can't, enough. Yeah. You can't. There's not enough of each one. <laughs> we have to do it by time. Um, so how do you quantify Scandal mm. in amongst all of that kind of stuff? We have stuff like the Battle of Malden poem shows that the literature was very, at the time was very interested in using stories to give a moral or a message rather than retelling. Um, the one thing I can come up with, really, is Emma. And if you take the view that Emma is involved with Beowulf's creation, which mm-hmm. I think we both kind of agreed we'll get on that boat, Yeah. Um, then women in power, scandalous, you know, doing, you know, is that scandal, is that not, and getting up and, yeah. Yeah. And also Emma herself had some pretty saucy scandals. She married the Saxon king, then he got exiled, so she married his the guy who defeated him mm. um, and then had children, then, dis- then disinherited her own children, then actually one of her children ended up there and because of her, William the Conqueror claimed royalty in England. They need to do like a, they need to do like some sort of, reality tv show yeah. and people don't know it but it's just the story oh, of emma a, of normandy um, what was the show the, we need the jeremy carl show emma <laughs> the jeremy carl show oh or at least an hbo drama of some sort she's amazing but i'm not sure how much you can put po- you can put her personal scandals into this i mean, it, it feels like a bit of a stretch no probably um not. there's also this is ecclesiastical poetry but we don't have sex in the literature particularly uh, yeah basically nothing I'm, I'm floundering i'll give it a 0.25 because i'm certain there'll be something which i <laughs> oh no <laughs> not a 0.25 oh. okay so i guess i'm gonna match you and make it an even 0.5 so the third category is ripple or riot here we judge whether this style caused a ripple or a riot how socially controversial was its existence and content Right, we actually have stuff for this, which is very exciting. Yes! A lot of modern readers, when you look at Beowulf and look at some of these other poems, particularly Battle of Mould Mm. and this kind of stuff, are wondering how much of them were political commentary. So uh, how much was the author someone trying to make comments on the actions of the kings of the time and this kind of stuff. And in fact, in Beowulf, there's been a lot of argument that there's significant parallel between the poem's characters of Beowulf and Wiglaf and historical kings of Mercia, named Bjorn Wolf and Wiglaf. And, okay. it is, and it is supposed that Wiglaf or, um, of Mercia commissioned Beowulf as a demonstration of his fitness to succeed Bjorn Wolf, who had been killed in battle in 826. That is one origin story of Beowulf, which um, I don't entirely get on board with. But it's an interesting thing. There's another example. Um, so if that's true, then Beowulf was, was commissioned. Remember, it would have been expensive to commission poetry. Mm -hmm. as a political game say saying i should be the one to take over the throne another example is uh so canute conquered england in 1016 and it could again these poems could be a thinly veiled um history of the goings-on in contemporary wessex in the 11th century so the wealth figure might represent emma of normandy and wessex emma ruled wessex for a single year as femme sole as the only queen uh, in 1035 when Canute died because she was she was placeholding right. for her son to come back 
But again, this idea of uh, is this character in, Be- in Beowulf connected with her because of what she did there, or was she, or perhaps mm. Emma then commissioned it because she wanted to justify why, you know. So there's there's a lot of that perhaps, where they might yeah. be using literature and commissioning as political pawns. But, um, <laughs> basically, in Beowulf, there's a lot of matriarchal. Um, history so one of the biggest villains is Grendel's mother and there's a lot about of associations between royal women in Anglo-Saxon and Norse literature of this time and their roles in the circulation of cups at a feast and if you give a cup to someone a cup bearer would be the person who could poison you so it's a position of trust all this kind of thing and also someone who is and the distribution of treasure so in the literature and in the kind of fictions quite often a woman would be the one who for example with, with, with Arthur gives Excalibur to him so it's this idea of a woman who is in in a position of power who will give the power to to the to the hero, and it and if and if Emma commissioned some of these works, that's a real interview power. Yeah, she's, she's got she's the a, power. King, yeah, she's a kingmaker. I mean, oh god! Well, no, she is. <laughs> well, Edward the Confessor, she made a kingmaker. I mean, you said yeah. it. It was me being um, far too histor- historically up myself and talking and thinking about the Wars of the Roses <laughs> and the, Warwick the kingmaker, and then you. <laughs> and then you no, that's literally little... my brain doesn't go there. I don't know these things, so I go, oh yeah, she literally <laughs> she made a king. Yeah, she did make a king. She gave birth. to that's I love like... it. You just stopped me getting up myself. It's wonderful. <laughs> She gave birth. She um, gave birth. No. Yeah. <laughs> Woohoo! All right. Um, the final point about um, Ripple, Ripple and Riot is that a lot of these literature clearly went very deep into the, into the psyche. So no matter what kind of political games were happening about the literature, they clearly went very deep into the stories. Mm. So um, the dream of the rude, which you mentioned earlier, is widely regarded as the greatest of all English religious poems. And we actually have um, the graffiti of the Green of the Rude carved into some panels in a church in Northumbria, in Northumbrian dialect of Old English. So it isn't just normal Old English, it is the Northumbrian dialect of Old English. Quite sweet. Yeah. And it's also in runic alphabet because Roman script is too hard to carve. So they spent a lot of time working out how to do mm. it. And it just shows how deeply this kind of literature... Yeah, it's funny because when you say graffiti, you immediately think someone with a spray can doesn't mm. really care what they're doing. But actually, clearly it does have a big has had a big impact on people okay so mm. we've got we've got emma we've got grendel's mother we've got positions of power we've got potentially coming into power we've got um the dream of the rude so i'm i'm guessing it's caused quite a big riot then did it cause more of a yeah. riot than a ripple i think so so definitely over five i'm thinking eight okay cool uh so then we're going to finally look at the legacy. So how has this style influenced the future? Before you even say anything, I feel like this is going to have a huge influence on the future. I, well, I don't know what about it. I just, I know it's going to be, it's going to be a big one. It's a really interesting point. Basically, it should. It should have this absolutely enormous influence. And we, we could definitely bring in the legacy points around creating words and all the rest of it. But there is much less legacy than there should be. And there's a real specific reason for that which is the deliberate and concerted destruction of Anglo-Saxon culture by the Normans. Um, so right. because of Hastings, 85% of Old English was lost. Mm. It's interesting that still our most common words used uh, are Old English, mm-hmm. but a lot of the other words, gone. You know, other things have come in. So like the, the, ba- the basic spine is still Old English, but the culture and especially the traditions of playwriting and the traditions of this kind of way of writing vanish. I mean, have you heard of a Caesura poem? nowadays this thing of having a break in the middle english itself was not immediately stamped out there are manuscripts in old english until at least a century after uh, after the conquest but as we said english was always the archive language and manuscripts are not literature like the normans were systematic and totally destructive in their attempt to stamp out any anglo-saxon culture in empire and so things like beowulf disappeared these these manuscripts basically vanished into archives and only really began to be really uh rediscovered in the 18th century it's amazing that we have like the anglo-saxon chronicle then because i'd imagine that would be something that they'd want to completely destroy well it's uh there's no point destroying history I see. but it's about the culture and about this kind of stuff and so um because because english had this enormous history of archive but mm. the the culture literally the plays the stuff we talk about is completely especially because um English was no longer the ruling language. You, uh, all the courts and the church and the Bibles and the laws mm. were all done in Norman French uh, or Latin. 
I mean, a good exa- a good a clear example of the change is in modern day speech. Uh, mm. Our words for animal and meat, the animal, mm. which is the unrefined, therefore the servants, are the old words, and the word for the meats, so the stuff that would come to table, are the Norman French words, so sheep and mutton, cow mm. and beef, cow and boeuf, and it's a really good illustration of this kind of this class divide of English and Norman French. And it took 300 years or so for English to be the crowning language again. And this is a tangent, but I think it's worth saying as well. This happened a thousand years ago for us, but something very similar is happening right now. So there was a Guardian article a few weeks back on the importance of poetry and oral storytelling. Poetry is is incredibly important, one of the most key facets of the Mm -hmm. culture of the Uyghur Muslims in China. And I'm sure we've mostly heard about the concentration camps and what's going yeah. on. In fact, we don't necessarily know what's going on, but it all sounds very, very ominous. But in Uyghur culture, uh, poetry is incredibly respected and it's a form of self-expression and c- the cultural importance. So it, you know, it would go from everything from you were taught in school to write poetry, because in that culture, that was how you expressed yourself. Poetry was one of the greatest things in bookshops for the Uyghur culture. And, you know, even you'd use little rhymes to teach your children how to uh, mm-hmm. table manners and, how, and what you should do and that yeah. X, Y and Z. Like nursery rhymes, but it was much more important. And the Chinese are at the moment uh, systematically and intentionally stamping it out in the hopes of creating a homogenized Han Chinese identity. Exactly the same tactics as they did in mm-hmm. Tibet 50 years ago or so. It's exactly the same thing as the Normans are doing to us. It's that yeah. you, this, and we did to the Welsh. Yeah. You know, it, God knows we are not, you know, <laughs> uh, alone in this. But this, this kind of thing of going, no, you are not allowed your final culture. Mm. We are an empire. We are this. And therefore, you must be homogenized into this one great you identity. You must lose your individualism. It's- yeah. And basically, exiled, exiled mm. Uyghur Muslims are, of course, <laughs> fighting back. Um, but when separated from their main audience of 12 million people how long can this tradition this very very old style survive mm. and um it was one of those things where i just i was researching this and thinking because i always um i have so much grief for the loss of what of what must have been lost when, and um mm. so clearly just aggressively stamped out much of this culture and um oh, it's so pertinent to read this now as i because I, I read this article while i was doing the research for this episode you know it's just so harrowing, isn't it, mm. when you realise that history repeats itself? I mean, they say history repeats itself, but I don't think you ever quite think of it in this context in terms of, like, the errors of history. It's like we learn absolutely nothing. It's just... Yeah, I mean, I don't know really what to say. Like, it makes me despair. It makes me despair. Anyway, um, so back on the positivity, you know, English did survive because we're speaking it right now. <laughs> it just had to go in a hibernation for a bit. So in terms of legacy, this is the beginning of English literature, which mm. is very exciting. As the Normans stamped in and imposed as kind of this ruling class of Norman French, we get poems like Arthur, Arthurian legend and Hero with the Wake. And these are poems. And the fact that, we, that uh, those were written and we still know about them today prove that they they are incredibly pertinent that they stem from this tradition and also that that something still survived this legacy that though the normans were still there there was a way that this continued so the fact we still have these stories so powerfully and that they arrived in some form arthur got picked up by the normans obviously Mm heron of the wake did not (laughs) no (laughs) um but the fact that even survives shows just how influential the poem poets would have been after invasion is my point. So maybe the legacy score is not so low. No, it's not. Well, I mean, most of this was really rediscovered in 18th, 19th, 20th century, when people really began to start relooking at Old English. And Beowulf alone has 14 novel adaptations, 11 comics, 14 operas and musical mm. theatre shows, seven games, 11 films, and has been taken on by everyone from mm. Neil Gaiman to J.R.R. Tolkien to Seamus Heaney. Wow, okay. Beowulf alone. So, like, there is an enormous mm. legacy in our popular culture, even though there wouldn't have been a complete through line, and there's an enormous dip. But do you think if there were more Old English poems like Beowulf, Beowulf would be as popular? Do you, you know, do you, know what, do you get what I mean? I do, and... T- no, I, I totally get it. I I agree. It's, it's a really hard question to answer. It's a bit like asking... Um, uh if you look at ancient greek and look at you know that there are only so many plays left of um 
of Sophocles and of Aristophanes and this kind of thing and if we had their entire canon and so the ones we do have might not have been their best ones but are so much more special for the fact that we have them (laughs) we've just got them we've got something yeah yeah. um I mean another argument for the absence which is quite fun is that we would not have Lord of the Rings if uh Old English had been uh had survived the Normans Oh, okay. Explain this. So this is a really fun little fact. But um, J.R.O. Tolkien was an academic in Cambridge, I think. And he his uh, specialism was Mm. Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic. That is actually a degree, if you ever wanted to do it. Um, And he had this enormous grief Mm. around the fact that so much was lost. A huge grief. And one of the greatest Mm. things we lost at that time is we lost our pagan gods. We lost our old myths. So, yes, we have little whispers of the giant of Somerset and of this and of that, but we do not have hmm. the Pantheon like the Norse do or like the Greeks do because because it was stamped out by the Normans, because it was suppressed and got rid of. And so uh, Tolkien endeavoured to write a new myth. It was his dream with Lord of the Rings, let's give this country a myth. Yeah, That would be nice, wouldn't it, to have for other people, yeah. let's give them a myth. And then, what are we, 90 years later, it's obsessed? Yeah. That's special. So that's quite special. And mm. the final thing I'll end you with is a good old quote from Churchill, which is, We shall fight them on the beaches. We shall fight them on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Only surrender is not Old English. Only the word sur- surrender is French, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which you could go, oh, well, there's a thing there, isn't there? Oh. Wow. <laughs> that is quite impressive, actually, when you hear it like that. <laughs> it shows just how deeply ingrained, though there was suppression and oppression and so much was lost. So much survived as well at the same time. Um, okay, the Lord of the Rings has thrown me because I was going to say, oh, um, it's a shame that it hasn't got a bigger legacy. It's almost like because it was stamped out, we got an enormous. We got Lord of the, the Rings, which is <laughs> huge. <laughs> oh, yeah. okay then. So I, I reckon probably a, I'm going to give it a solid seven for legacy. What about you? Mm. Um, I'm going eight because it's also it's the birth of English. Literature. I mean yes, but I mean <laughs> you know. it's the birth of English literature plus Lord of the Rings. Thirty nine point five out of eighty. Ooh. Oh, it's just off 50%. It's only just off 50%. Um, <laughs> by one single half By point. a point. Um, yeah, that was really interesting. I d- I d- when I thought of the Anglo-Saxon period, not, not much knowing about it, I didn't really know that it was because Normans were stamping it out. I thought it was more that we just, it not survives. <laughs> you know, I never really considered that actually it had been wiped out yeah. from our... Yeah, and also when we think Dark Age, you think, oh, well, they weren't doing anything. They were in yeah. mud huts. Which is so not true. They are writing really complicated riddles about swords. Or shields. (laughs) Or even shields. (laughs) Oh, Or even shields is the actual answer. Um, Does it make the cut? I... uh... Oh, because I say no. I'm going to put my cards on the table. I think it doesn't make it. No. No. I'm going to say yes just to put my stake in the ground, but it's probably right. It's it's one of these kind of things because we, we said that it has to be both of us. It to has get to be in. unanimous yeah. in order to and get it, in. It's so. because, partly also because we didn't get put Vikings in. Mm. Um, and this feels like a continuation of Vikings is just that extra bit more because it's English. It's the birth of English. And also, I really feel for this one. Like it really kind of, it, it connects yeah. something very deep. It's a sorrowful one. Yeah. Mm. But um, it still doesn't quite make it though, does it? It could have. kind of... But, I think it's the best mate of Fireside, and it comes to visit Fireside quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's probably the <laughs> poor old Fireside who's currently alone in the House of Rebels going, guys, does anyone Hello? anyone, anyone want to <laughs> join? I've waited a thousand years <laughs> for someone. <laughs> and I'm going to end up oh, talking God. to loads of Shakespeare nonces. <laughs> like, we're just like, oh, God, anyone, so it has to, it's just going to be Fireside <laughs> we, we've alone. Left Fireside alone in the House of Revels for a thousand years. Oh, so is, that's it then. We've yes, just covered. What are we calling English? <laughs> old English. <laughs> we've just called it, we've just covered Old English Beowulf. Um, old the English return of the. Or oh, we could do like a Lord of the Rings themed title. like. Um, okay, go for it. Okay. Return of the Dane. Um, return of the Dane. 
Return of the mm, Return of the Beowulf. No, we do. The twin. Don't we? we have sure, to. Think well, everyone's going to know what it is because they're going to like to add. <laughs> it's going to be the title. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's it. I think, Mingma, we've yes, just covered. Yes, so that is it. We've just we've just covered old English, the beginnings of English. Anyway. Yeah. Of, of English literature, English plays, English Beowulf. Beowulf. Uh, if you enjoy this episode, you can rate and review us and press subscribe to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. Have you got a nugget of info about Old English Beowulf that you would like to share with us? We'd love to hear from you. You can get in touch via our social media. On Twitter and YouTube, <laughs> we are House of Revels. And on Instagram, we are House of Revels with underscores. Um... Gotta love, Gotta love those underscores. I'm going to really spell it out for people. So it's house underscore of underscore revels. Thank you for listening. See you next See time. You next time. <laughs>